This story starts with a girl whose name is Anne. She is studying at the first year of university and just loves to read books. And just recently, she's taken a fancy to a famous story called The Death of the Wicked Duke Gerald. The name of the antagonist is Gerald Stuart. He is the tyrant king of the Alvarad Empire, whom the protagonist seeks to overthrow. Practicing forbidden magic, the ruler severely punishes anyone who gets in his way. Therefore, the citizens are constantly in fear for their innocent lives. However, when Anne looks at him, she feels an incredible sadness inside. The plot doesn't really delve into Gerald's past, and the guy immediately becomes a villain, but he wasn't always a ruthless tyrant. The ruler's marriage when the Union fell apart is also mentioned in passing. Those close to the royal court forced him to marry Princess Alana. Immediately after the marriage, Alana learned Gerald's secret, namely about the man's precious son, Demaris. The boy has a power that in their world is considered with a curse, so all people judged him. And just like that, the princess mercilessly killed Demaris. It was a great blow to his father. And just like that, enraged by the loss of his son, Gerald executed his princess. Then, he declared war on this stupid world. If he hadn't lost the one he loved most in the world, it might have ended differently. If only someone had been on Gerald's side, he might not have been so angry. As Anne finished the story, she had many thoughts. She thought that if only she could help him after all this tragedy. But of course, that's impossible. She should just return the book and forget it. But then suddenly, as she was walking up the stairs, she smelled something strange. And when the girl walked over to the TV, she saw that it was on fire. Anne immediately wondered if anyone was inside. Then she cautiously opened the door, looked to see who was there, and saw a little boy standing in the middle of the room. Anne ran up to him and told him not to be afraid, for she would get him out of there. But as the girl walked, she thought it was very strange. The apartment was so suddenly engulfed in fire, and this child. But then all of a sudden, she looked up and saw that the chandelier was falling. Anne immediately ran over to the boy and shouted for him to be safe, hugging him. The girl couldn't believe it. Would she really die? But at that moment she heard a phrase. The Save the Tyrant game has been activated. Anne also heard the phrase, Welcome player, to the game The Death of Evil Duke Gerald, and her character is Brianna. Her goal is to change Duke Gerald's fate in 90 days. At this point, the probability of success is 15%. If the success rate is 100%, the mission is complete. If the success rate is zero, the mission is failed. The reward for victory is a return to the real world, and the penalty for defeat is death. The girl was surprised. It wasn't like she had asked for this. Anne was surprised that she should change the tyrant's fate in exchange for her return. She doesn't want that, because reading about it all is one thing, but meeting him face to face. But then suddenly some strange picture appeared in front of her. A man holding a baby in his arms, and a meter with interest appeared. Afterward, the stranger said she had seen something she shouldn't have seen and only the dead can keep secrets. And at that moment, the girl received a system message about player character information. Her name is Brianna Jones, and at the moment the girl is 21 years old. She is a private tutor. Anne remembered this girl. Her name only came up in the novel. One day, Brianna Jones came to Stuart Manor to interview for a teaching position. She witnessed Demoris lose control of her magic. And in a great panic, the girl lost consciousness. And apparently at the moment, she was supposed to die in the fire. Anne suddenly moved into her body at the very last moment. This means that Gerald thinks she's learned Demoris' secret, and that's why he's going to kill her. At that moment, the man took a swing at the girl. Anne immediately screamed and asked if he was really going to kill an innocent person. But then suddenly, the girl heard the interest begin to decline, and Gerald said that she had broken into the estate to harm the child, and that's why she deserved to die. Anne saw the continued descent and thought she needed to buy some time. Then she said she was wrong. She was trying to protect the little master. They were trying to hurt him. She came in to interview for a teaching position, but then she saw a small gentleman surrounded by flames. Gerald sternly said that if she did nothing, then why did Demoris get inflamed? Anne noticed that the success rate kept dropping, and dropping, and dropping. Then she shouted out for his lordship to believe her. Gerald looked at his son, who was barely breathing in his arms, the man was concerned, and at that moment, the girl's warning popped up that the success rate was below 10%. If it dropped to zero, the devastating ending would come even sooner than it should. 
Anne didn't know what she should do. It had already dropped to 8%. Would she really die right now? Gerald said he'd had enough of her lies, but Brianna reprimanded him to wait. Afterward said that she knew how to cure the little gentleman. The man was interested. He walked closer to the girl, touched her chin, and told her that he didn't know what games she was trying to play. But he would give her just one chance. After these words, Anne received a notice to remember that death in the game world meant death in the real world as well. After all that had happened, little Demaris was taken to the living room, where he went to bed. Brianna stroked his back and sang a lullaby to make the boy sleep better. In the novel, every time Demoris loses control of his magic, Nanny sings him this song. The girl, of course, wasn't sure if she was singing it right, but the words were the same, so she really hoped it would work. Gerald watched the whole thing. It was the first time he'd ever seen Demaris calm down so quickly, and the girl's way really worked. Even though she was trying to make excuses to resolve the situation, he didn't see an ounce of fear or dislike for the boy's magic in her. Gerald took a closer look at the girl and thought that even if he did, he should still keep an eye on her. Suddenly, the plaque flashed in front of Anne again, and she noticed that her success rate had risen to 11%. Then she looked at the boy and realized that he was okay, too. And it was beautiful. But then suddenly she heard Gerald calling her. The girl was very frightened. But Brianna smiled and asked what he wanted. The girl tried to hide her excitement. Then the Duke said that he congratulated her. She was hired, and from now on the girl would be Demaris's private tutor. Anne should have been pleased at these words, but she was concerned that her success rate was beginning to decline again. Gerald thought at this point that no matter what happened, there was no problem that he couldn't handle. And so it had been a few days since Anne had gotten into a story she had just recently finished reading. Life in the world was much calmer than she had anticipated, and nothing more had happened to Demaris yet. In fact, it was not as the girl had imagined, for every day she teaches, she is surrounded by nothing but lessons. But she was glad at least that Gerald wasn't visiting her anymore, and the success rate was still the same. No doubt the girl is glad not to face the main antagonist of the story, but she was still concerned about the low level. And if it doesn't rise in the future, Anne won't be able to raise the bar of points for the assignment, and she misses Hot Pots, Noodles, and King Kali madly. Then suddenly, while the girl was thinking about all this, Demaris looked at her and wondered himself. He hesitated a bit, but eventually turned to Mrs. Brianna. The girl was surprised and asked if he needed to explain anything. But the guy looked at the girl and asked, Is she really leaving so soon? Brianna wondered and asked why he thought that way. Yes, Boris said. All the kindergartners he used to tutor ended up leaving him. Anne thought about it and realized that it really was like that. Surrounding experiences in a world of magic. And if anyone is caught practicing witchcraft, even if it's a child, it's going to be very hard on them. And even the Duke's son is no exception to these rules. Plus, for his age, the boy is still not good with spells, causing them to often break out on their own. To protect his child, the father periodically substitutes governesses to look after the boy. So it was no longer surprising to Anne why Demoris was so concerned. Then Brianna touched his face and said that not at all. She would be with the young master until the very end. And at the end she smiled and added that, if he didn't mind that, of course. The boy hearing this was very happy and said okay. But at that moment, their wonderful idea was broken up by their father walking in on them. Anne immediately pretended to explain something to the young gentleman while Gerald watched them. While Brianna explained the material to the boy, Anne wondered for what reason she felt as if she had been caught reading a short story during the lecture. It even made the girl feel uncomfortable and she started to shiver with fear. But then suddenly Gerald said that that was enough for today. Afterward, he added that he noticed that Brianna made a pretty good teacher. The girl smiled and said it was all just because of his son's hard work. And after that, they just stared at each other nervously for a while. Anne was afraid, and wondered if she had done something to displease the Duke again. And then suddenly, when Gerald was about to say something, the girl immediately interrupted him and apologized, saying that she swore she'd never make another rash mistake, and she thought she couldn't let the scale fall any lower. But Gerald turned away and sighed heavily saying that passers-by, if they saw her clothes, would surely think the ducal mansion didn't pay its governesses enough. Then Anne examined her clothes, and noticed that she was wrinkled in some places, and there was a hole in her skirt that had been left by the fire on the first day. Gerald told her to hurry up and dress up prettier, but the girl was embarrassed and said she had nothing else but that dress. The man looked at her contemptuously, and told her to buy clothes from the local shops then. 
and when Brianna was about to say that she didn't have the money for it, Gerald said that of course she would buy it on his dime. Anne of course was glad of this, and said she would fulfill everything. But just as she was about to go, Demaris tugged at her sleeve. He turned to Miss and said that yesterday she had promised him to play together after the reading. Anne, looking at the boy, thought he was too cute for her perception. Well, then she patted him on the head and said they'd go together right away. Suddenly she realized she had said something stupid. How could she ask to take Demoris for a walk right in front of Gerald? The girl wondered if it was too late to retract her words. Then she began to look at the boy and the Duke, saying that a new outfit could wait. Demaris asked seriously, Is she saying that? Would she and Brianna really have fun? His look was very pitiful. So Anne simply didn't have the guts to reject him. So she asked Gerald how he felt about the offer. The Duke looked at the girl with an evil gaze. She at this moment thought that this was a real creepy thing. Indeed, he is some kind of tyrant. For a while the man just stood there looking at the two of them, but then sighed and said okay. Demoris and the girl immediately rejoiced. But then suddenly the Duke said that in that case they would all go together. So after a while, all three of them packed up and drove into town. Anne, stepping out of the wagon, began to pass looking around. It was her first time leaving the mansion since moving to the novella. Then suddenly the girl thought about Gerald's words when he said they would go together. She doesn't even know for what reason. But her success suddenly went up a whole unit. At that moment, the girl inside felt as if she was moving even in the right direction. This, of course, pleased her. But then suddenly, as she looked around, she saw people looking at her and talking about something. Anne wondered, were they really talking about Gerald? At that moment, a man got out of the wagon and stood beside her. It was no surprise to Anne, why the locals were very frightened as soon as they saw the Duke. For in the novella, this scene is described rather grimly. Namely, the Duke's gaze from the throne is forever fixed on the submissive Christians of the city, and his cold eyes, which glare as if they were wolf-like, easily strike fear into crowds of people. But then suddenly Gerald turned to Lady Brianna and said that it was time for them to go. The girl, distracted from her musings, said of course. After that they went on their way, Anne. Walking behind them, she turned around and saw people still whispering. So after a while they came to a store with clothes. The owner, when she met them, said they were honored guests. She then called her employees over and told them that these were new outfits from the seasonal collection. They could feel free to look closely at everything. After that... The girl brought out one dress, and said that this one, for example, was sewn better than their seamstress from the Kingdom of White. A perfect choice for a young lady. Anne was very nervous, but said she wasn't used to such elegant things, and thought it was a little too bright. Then the owner brought another dress, and said that it had jewels sewn into it from the Principality of Borgen. They would emphasize the beauty of her eyes. After that, other sellers also started bringing different dresses for the girl and offering them. Anne didn't have time to look at the previous dress, but another one was brought to her. The girl didn't understand what this dizzying fashion show was all about. But then suddenly Gerald told the saleswoman that they were taking everything. Anne was surprised she didn't understand what he was saying. At which point Demuris said they'd take those too, pointing to another pile of dresses. The girl didn't even have time to answer anything before the Duke asked the saleswoman to take the purchases to the Ducal Mansion. So when Anne realized she wasn't being listened to at all, she screamed and asked him to wait just one second. Then the success meter appeared in front of her again, and she saw that she had one point taken away from her again. The girl didn't understand what kind of system this was. Was even a phrase like that a step backwards? Then Brianna calmed down a bit and turned to His Majesty, saying that she was very grateful for his generosity. However, they were too expensive for people of her position then added that it would not be particularly acceptable to train a young master in such clothing, and asked if he agreed. At that moment, Gerald pictured the girl in those beautiful outfits in his son's class. He thought about it, and then he said he understood. Let her take anyone she liked then. Anne thanked him, and noticed that the success rate had increased inversely. After some more time, they finally finished their shopping and went outside. Anne was very tired during this time. The girl did not even think that going shopping for clothes could affect the level of joy. Therefore, one should be more careful and much more attentive. However, it was still a pretty good walk. They passed a bookstore, and the girl thought it would be a good idea to visit it and buy books related to this world. The girl then turned to the gentleman and asked if he would allow her to step aside for a while to buy her textbooks. Gerald turned to her and asked where she wanted to go. 
Then Brianna pointed to the bookstore and said that they sold them over there. The man sighed and said, Okay, she could go. But then suddenly a guy ran up to them and called out to the Duke. It was Otis Chamlet, Gerald's most trusted officer. He came up to the Duke and whispered something in his ear. Then Gerald turned away and told them to go home first. There would be guards outside and he would be back soon. Anne said they would do as he ordered. After that, she watched as the Duke and the officer began to leave. When the men had gone quite far, Brianna turned to Edimurus and told them to stop by the bookstore already. But the boy ignored the teacher's words and called Ethan. Anne recognized the name immediately. In the novel, the man was described as having a young man's cloak developing in gusts of wind and his bag dangling. The earring was adorned with a magic stone. At that moment, Ethan walked up to the girl, whose name was Sophia, and apologized for being late. These two are the main protagonists of the story involving the death of the Golden Duke Gerald. A guy named Ethan Josiah and a girl named Sophia Adler. After that, Anne went into the bookstore and saw the two men. She thought it was such a strange coincidence. She realized that the bookstore belonged to them after all. This guy is an incredibly powerful wizard who has set up store to provide refuge for runaway wizards. Anne took some book from the shelf to pretend to read, while she herself peeped at them. The girl did not expect to meet the protagonists of the story so quickly. It is immediately obvious that the protagonist and heroine will be made very beautiful. Anne was sorry she couldn't hear what they were talking about. But if Demoris hadn't been around her, she might even have gotten acquainted. It was very surprising to the girl that the baby remained obedient even without a father, as if he were an angel. But at that moment she heard the boys talking to each other. One of them asked if he knew that the Stuart men had come for a walk today. The other guy was surprised and asked if it was true. His friend said that some people even say that the Duke's estate is being introduced to the unclean. The boy asked if it was a monster. It couldn't be. But his friend said his neighbor's wife delivered vegetables to the Duke's mansion and heard it with her own ears. She says it is locked in the basement, from which a ferocious shriek is very often heard. Well, the guy said it was probably just a normal animal. It was unlikely they would keep a monster in their house. But the other replied that there was no other explanation. If it wasn't true, then why did such gossip keep going around? He had even heard how the head of the family was able to easily beat hundreds of enemies at a time. That's ridiculous, isn't it? The Stuart family is sitting tight as defenders of the realm. They must have made a deal with a demon or worse. The other guy told him to stop talking such nonsense. If they heard them, you could immediately write yourself into the dead. Anne, who had overheard all this, now realized it turns out they have a similar opinion of everyone who has a close or direct relationship to Gerald. People believe he keeps monsters as pets and despise anyone associated with him. He makes no attempt to refute the gossip, allowing his own honor to sink into the mud, only for the sake of covering up Demoris's bursts of magic. Willingness to sacrifice part of an entire family just to protect his son. Anne thought that even though at times he seemed indifferent to his child, he loved with all his soul. But suddenly the man spoke again and said that his wife had died immediately after the birth of the child. He must have gotten rid of her. When Anne heard this, she couldn't stand this kind of dirty talk any longer. She came out from behind the bookshelf and shouted to those guys. But the girl didn't even have time to say anything. She heard a book fall behind her. When she turned around, she saw Demoris. There were purple flames all around the boy. Anne had completely forgotten that she had left him alone in the reading corner. The girl thought that there was no way she could let him lose control of his magic, not in public. Anne approached the young gentleman and asked if she could help him find some interesting book. After that, she suggested that he just leave. But Demoris didn't answer anything. He just stared at the girl while the purple fire around him continued to grow. Then Anne decided she needed to get the boy out soon because there were too many extra eyes in the bookstore. But as she looked around, she noticed that she had nowhere to hide. But then suddenly the girl remembered that according to the novel, Ethan keeps a portal to the magic lab in his shop just in case. That made her happy. So the girl walked over to the book rack and started going through the books, thinking that the portal must be in there somewhere. At that moment, she heard the voices of those men again. One of them said that if the Duke had made a deal with the devil, his son must be a monster too. Anne was angry again and thought to herself, so they should shut up already. Enough with the Duke's slander. But then suddenly another man said that no one had ever seen the Stuart offspring in person. The other guy asked if the rumors were really true. Demoris, who heard all this, became even more angry. He shouted out, 
What kind of monster? They were all lying. After that, a strong surge of energy came out of him. Because of this, even some bookshelves started crying, and books started falling off them. Anne saw all this and screamed. No, she rushed to the boy, hugged him, and told him to calm down because he couldn't let anyone see him. She wondered exactly where that teleportation item was. She needed to find it as soon as possible. Then she looked at the bookshelf and saw one of the books light up. Anne had finally found the right one. At that time, all the people got scared. Sophia asked Rita if he had heard anything. The boy thought it was a strong burst of magic. Then he looked at Anne and said that apparently it belonged to her. The men who spread the rumor said they heard the voice of a child between the racks, standing with a girl. But when Ethan walked over, they weren't there. He went to check his bookshelf and noticed that his portal was gone. At that moment, Anne, along with the boy, stepped out of the portal into the lab. In the original novel, Ethan disguised the entrance to his hideout as a book, and correctly pressing the letter on the spine of the binding opens the gate. The girl was very glad that they had escaped in time. Then she looked at the boy and noticed that Demoris had lost consciousness because of the energy release. She mentally apologized to him for not being able to stand up for him. But at that moment, the girl heard footsteps behind her, and when she turned around, she saw a blonde-haired man. It was then that she realized that the entrance was being kept secret from the others. The girl didn't know what to say if this guy asked about it. Well then, Ethan asked the girl to tell how she had managed to curb such a huge flow of mana. He asked what she was, apparently a very powerful sorceress. Let the girl share her secrets. Anne immediately said it wasn't what he thought it was. But at that moment Demaris, who was lying in the girl's arms, began to shiver and whimper. The girl looked at the boy and saw that his condition was getting worse. Then Ethan asked, what happened to him in the first place? But at that moment, Anne remembered that he was after all one of the strongest magicians in the city, so the guy would definitely be able to help. And the girl turned to Eaton and told him to save him. The girl began to beg. The guy was a little surprised but said okay, he'll give it a try. And at that moment he began to use magic over the boy's head. Anne was surprised that he actually began to heal him, which is to be expected from a protagonist whom Roman described as valiant and kind. And after Ethan finished his treatment, the boy began to breathe normally. The girl immediately thanked him for that. Then the man said that her little friend had after all fallen due to the depletion of his magic. So it turns out that that massive surge was his. Anne thought for a moment. Did she need to talk about it? But then she said it was the right thing to say. She didn't understand why Ethan was suddenly asking about it. When the guy said he thought otherwise after all, Anne immediately apologized for not living up to his expectations. Then she wondered why she had done it in the first place. But then Ethan got serious and said that since she couldn't do magic, how had she gotten into the lab? Anne was worried because the guy kept asking questions. The girl didn't know what words would be best to choose. But then suddenly the man said that if she didn't use strong magic to remove the charms, then she just knew where the gate was. He asked the girl to tell him the truth. Anne would have liked to tell him the truth, but she thought she would not be believed. The girl began to imagine how she says she read about all this in a book, and he is in fact a character in a fictional story where his nemesis is Gerald. Anne thought for sure he'd think she was crazy and just kill her. When the girl asked him if she would sound believable if she said she found the move by accident, and their answer was that I could lie, it was a huge mistake on her part. Anne hesitated. She didn't know what she should do, but then she decided she shouldn't languish, especially after his help to Demaris. At that moment, Ethan thought she couldn't even think of a way to get out of it, and was still trying to find some excuse for herself. He wondered and thought, is she really protecting this boy? When the boy was about to say something to her, they heard someone's voice. He said to turn every corner upside down immediately. They were very surprised, and they're asked what it was doing up there. And at that moment a table with the success rate appeared in front of Anne. Her points began to drop significantly, and a warning appeared that the danger success bar was dropping and approaching the tipping point. Anne was shocked. She thought that Gerald must have already found out he was missing. Then she told Ethan that the Duke must have shown up. She very urgently needs to give him her son. The guy was surprised and asked, Is it really his child? At that moment, the girl wondered if there were more problems if she revealed Demaris's identity. But she doesn't have time to ponder anyway. She had to win the Duke's favor now, so she turned to him and told him she was right. The boy was shocked, but then Anne turned to the noble charmer. 
but the man answered nothing. When she called out to him again, and there his magic passed over her head, Anne didn't realize what it was he was doing, but she abruptly felt a wave of warmth flow through her body. Then Ethan pulled his hand away and said she could go this time. But she's now sealed, and if she tries to tell anyone about his hideout, the worst will happen. Anne didn't know if it was true. At that moment, and there wondered. Wasn't that too cruel? Then suddenly he didn't understand why she was suddenly quiet. Had he frightened her? Anne, who was watching him, thought that apparently Ethan was even more nervous than she was. And when the guy was about to say something, the game girl asked you, Is he really threatening her? The boy coughed and asked her to take his words seriously. He'd given her a warning, but she'd have to decide how to proceed. Anne. At this point I thought he was trying to look like some kind of scary beast, but in the end he wasn't very good at it. Then the girl waved him off and told him she understood, swore to take the secret to her grave, and thought that even if he hadn't put a spell on her, there was no way she would have blabbed anyway. However, he is very bad at playing the villain. Then she said that regarding the method of her teleportation, she promised to share. But a little later, this one smiled and said okay, let her let him escort her back. The girl nodded in agreement. Then the guy activated his magical powers, and they were already back in the bookstore in a split second. And when she teleported away, she saw that the success rate had already dropped to 6%. Gerald communicated with his assistant and told them to question everyone present in the shop carefully while they answered where Dimeris had gone. And at that moment, one of the guys who had been spreading rumors shouted out that he had seen the Duke. Immediately he turned around and looked at him. The guy said a lady came into the bookstore with a baby, and he believed she kidnapped him. Gerald, when he heard this, thought, Are they really saying this about Brianna? Then he turned to Odessus and told him to send the guards to find the girl, and to the two witnesses he wished to personally ask a few questions at the mansion. The success rate dropped lower and lower, and as Gerald was about to leave, someone called out to him. It was Anne who came out of the regular door, and she told the master to wait after which she explained that the young master needed to rest. Duke turned and looked at the girl with disdain, asking if it was true. Anne thought she should hang on. She needs to explain exactly the reason why she did what she did, or he'll turn her to mere dust with his rage. Then Brianna replied in a trembling voice that yes, she wanted to find a remote place where he could lie down. Afterward she said, lowering her voice, that it was all because a thing had happened like before. The Duke looked at her carefully and asked if it was true. The girl nodded, and thought to herself that she shouldn't speak directly about the mana surge, but it wasn't correct to withhold this point either, so she just hinted to explain herself already at the manor. Gerald just stood there for a while, staring at the girl. Afterward, he turned to Oris and told them to take everyone, for they were heading back to the mansion. And at that moment, Anne saw that the success rate had gone up 1%. That made her feel a little better. And so after a while, they finally returned to the manor. Gerald sat and watched the people in the bookstore being questioned. And Ethan was even tied to a cross. The Duke went up to him and told him that only the dead could keep secrets. But at that moment, Anne was startled awake in her bed. She thought that it must have been just a nightmare. She very much hoped that the presence in general was then all right. And after returning back to the estate, Gerald had placed Demaris under the care of a doctor. Anne actually thought he was building her up to a showdown but ended up just silently sending her back. The girl believes she was very nervous because she doesn't even remember dozing off. But it was a terrible dream. Gerald immediately realized after the hint that his son had lost consciousness due to a strong mana release. However, she is initially aware of the boy's secret. Anne does not know how to explain the situation to him. But at that moment, someone knocked at the girl's room. She immediately asked who it was. It was an employee of the house. He asked if my lady Brianna was awake. The girl, getting out of bed, told him to wait. She was about to open the door, and she didn't understand why the butler had suddenly decided to look in on her. When Anne arrived at the door, the man said the gentleman wished to see her, and he asked that she head to his office. The girl thought that apparently he had no other choice. At that moment, Gerald was in his office signing various documents. After a while, the girl came to him. She was shivering, whether from cold or fear. When the Duke allowed her to enter, she asked if he was expecting her. It felt as if he'd been interrogating people all night. Anne thought it was now the turn of the most important witness to the incident. Gerald sighed and said that he had talked to the visitors to the bookstore, 
and now everyone was sworn to silence and not spread any gossip. Anne was very frightened when she heard this and realized that it was not only in her dream but also in reality. The girl immediately went up to the Duke and asked him what he had done to them. Gerald just stared at her. But then suddenly Oris intervened in their conversation and said that they had just sent them home. Anne asked if she meant what she said, and the knight replied that of course the citizens were perfectly fine. Then she asked in a whisper what about torture, but the men only laughed, and Oris said that in all likelihood she had simply misunderstood those words. Gerald then turned to Mrs. Brianna, and the girl noticed that the success rate had stopped at 5% for the moment. Anne asked what he wanted, then the Duke inquired if she wanted to tell him the whole situation that had happened. The girl thought that apparently there was no point in looking for excuses at all. The system warned that if the scale dropped to zero, the mission would fail, so she'd have to be careful. Then Anne sighed heavily and said that was right, she knew about the young master's magical gift. Gerald remained silent and just listened to the girl, and she went on and said that the instability of his magic made his life very hard, and the Duke is carefully hiding it so that the baby is not treated as an outcast. Demaris may be forced to stay away from people all the time, but it's not his fault. And the girl herself believes that witchcraft is no crime at all. She said that if Gerald would let her, she would like to continue teaching his son. Anne thought, because a person like that must surely need love and protection. But Gerald answered nothing. He just looked at her and was silent. The girl didn't understand what was happening. Had she said something unnecessary? But after a while, the Duke did speak. He told her to go back to her room. Anne was very much surprised. She asked what it was that he was saying that, and she thought to herself that she had stepped in and he hadn't made a single rebuke in response. Not even a word. Gerard asked, Does she feel like talking about anything else? The girl startled and said, No, not at all. She would be on her way. When the girl was about to leave, the Duke told her to wait. After that, he came up to her, threw his jacket over her shoulders, and told her not to forget about etiquette. It's not proper for a lady to walk around the mansion in a nighty. It's wrong. The girl nodded back at him. And after that, she walked out the door. It was quite strange for her. It seemed as if the Duke's cold heart was beginning to melt a little. But in reality, Gerald is not as rough and tough as described in the novel. At this point, the Duke closed the door behind the girl and wondered. Did she really not think magic was bad? Guy didn't know if it was true. But at that moment... Anne received a notification that the success rate had increased by seven points. The next morning they all gathered together for breakfast, and a fine father-son meal seemed to be in order. But Anne didn't understand in what way she had become a part of her. This girl was very surprising, and she still has that scream in her ears when the maid came to wake her up. And after their conversation then in the office, the success scale went up very nicely. It was now as high as 12%. Anne thought she'd done a wonderful job, but then decided it didn't matter. Her food came first right now. However, she didn't realize what so much cutlery was on the table for when all she had taken was a small piece of meat and a salad. Anne was very confused when she saw so many devices. Gerald looked at the girl and noticed her frightened hands fumbling, not knowing what to take. He frowned. But at that moment someone knocked at their dining room. The Duke immediately said they could come in. Oris came up to him and apologized for interrupting him. But it was just that he had documents sent to him from the Imperial Palace. Anne's attention was immediately drawn to it because that is where the tragedy of the novel unfolded. Emperor holds a festival every three years to thank the gods for favors and protection. Everything was going smoothly in the novel until a bull that snapped and ran straight into the crowd during the commotion, Gerald saves the crown princess. And she will, of course, fall very much in love with her heroic savior. However, a few months later, the current rulers use their own family as leverage and force them to get married. Unable to object to anything, Gerald has to agree to it, and later the heiress to the throne becomes the most important villain of the story. Remembering all this, Anne even accidentally dropped the knife on the floor. Gerald noticed it and asked what was wrong. The girl apologized for her clumsiness. Then the Duke put the letter on the table, pointing to it and asked Brianna if she was involved. The girl was surprised. She didn't understand why he would suddenly ask such a thing. But Gerald turned to his son and said that the Emperor had mentioned bringing Demaris. The boy was just reaching the age when he should be shown in public as often as possible and would need careful supervision. Anne, hearing all this, thought that if she got there, 
she would be able to find a way to keep Gerald from meeting the crown princess, and also keep them from getting close, and then maybe the trouble will be over. The girl will complete the mission and safely return to her homeworld, where she will be able to live her life in peace. Then Anne turned to the duke and told him he need not worry. She promised to take care of the young master, and she thought to herself that she would certainly try to steer fate in a better direction for the sake of them all. And now three days had passed since that conversation. Anne strolled through the garden at the manor and thought that soon everything would begin. And she has absolutely no idea how to prevent the princess and the duke from meeting. That's why the girl was even a little panicked. Anne worried too much that she hardly even had time to rest, and even woke up in the morning with a throbbing head. The girl hopes that a walk in the fresh air will at least remedy this situation. And so as she was walking, she didn't notice Gerald walking toward her and accidentally bumping into her. Anne immediately apologized and said she just wasn't looking at the road and accidentally crashed. But when she looked at who she was facing, she was very surprised that it was a duke. Gerald shrugged off his uniform and asked if she always walked without looking around. Anne became embarrassed and apologized to him. Well then, she asked him what time he'd be back for the festival. Gerald leaves early in the morning and doesn't get back until after dark. He'd been doing this for a long time, and now she was even curious as to why he'd decided to stop by so soon. Duke said for her to meet Madame Lydia. She would be her etiquette teacher for the next few days. The girl said hello to Brianna. Anne certainly didn't expect this. The Duke said that Demaris and Oris had relayed her concerns about the carnival. The girl stood up because of this, very embarrassed. She even covered her face with her hands and felt very depressed. But then, Gerald said that in principle few people are naturally good at showing. But knowing Madame Lydia was a huge exception. Under her supervision, she would immediately improve her skills. Anne was surprised and wondered if it was all for her. And at that moment, the girl remembered that then in the office, he had also appeared indifferent. But in the end, he had shown care and even warmth. Anne decided that probably his heart was not as cold as he thought. Then the girl looked up and addressed his grace, after which she smiled and thanked him. And at that moment, Anne received a new notification that her luck level had increased by another 1%. And soon the very day of the Harvest Festival arrived. Anne and all the others were beautifully dressed up in honor of such a celebration. And so after a while, Anne, watching the incident, realized that here it was about to begin. The novel's narrative. Gerald and the princess first met on stage for a performance. In order to prevent tragedy, Anne will have to take certain measures, as the girl will fall in love with him right during the incident. The girl has so much left to do, get the duke away from this and everything will be fine. But she wasn't entirely sure if she'd be able to turn, even fate, the other way. Anne didn't understand why this was happening at all. But the success scale was climbing rapidly, and it was already showing 13% there. At that moment the girl heard the voice of the maid, who said that the carriage was already in place. And Anne immediately saw a wagon coming in their direction. So she decided it was not right to fill her head with bad thoughts right now. For the sake of Demaris herself and, of course, Gerald, she must give her best. At that moment, a wagon pulled up to them. The boy, when the doors opened, was immediately happy because his daddy was there. But Demaris only thought so. Because when the wagon doors opened, Otis was there, and the boy was even upset about it. Anne was surprised too, and for what reason he was here. The knight went up to the boy and apologized, saying that his dad had not been able to come and take him to the party. After that, Otis had already addressed the girl as well, saying that the duke should make a speech on behalf of the imperial family. But the guy said they didn't have to worry because he would walk them to the carnival market. At that moment the girl thought that this was her moment to put the plan into action. But at that moment Demoris turned to the knight and offered to wait for his father before he joined them. The boy apologized to him and said he had a lot of work to do. Anne looked at the boy and saw that he was a little upset. Then she whispered to him not to be frightened, but just to keep pushing his point. And at that moment, Demoris looked at the knight carefully and said that if she obeyed that order, he would report him to his father. Oris turned to the carriage and said, Okay, so be it. Though he wasn't sure if the duke would agree to such a proposal. And after a few minutes, Anne and the young gentleman were backstage. There were a lot of people going about their business. As they walked in, the girl told the little guy that he was doing great. He did a great job on his first step. 
two days before, as Anne was putting the young gentleman to bed, said that it would probably be nice if the gentleman would take a walk with him. Demaris agreed with her. Then the girl told him to play along, since they had agreed. In fact, if there is one thing in the world that can make a busy person drop any business and even give up watching a show, it is, of course, their own child. Oris, when he escorted them backstage, he really hoped that the Duke wouldn't get angry about it. And at that moment, an announcer to the crowd announced for there to be applause because the Duke of Stuart himself had come to visit them. A man stepped up to the microphone, and when the applause died down, he said his name was Gerald Stewart, and he was pleased to welcome them. But then suddenly two heads appeared from behind the scenes. Anne, looking out, was surprised. Had the performance already begun? Duke began to make his speech, in which he said that the locusts which were coming over from the north of the state had been completely exterminated. The foundations for the new houses have already been laid, and the citizens who have lost their roof over their heads will be given the necessary assistance. Anne, who was watching all this, thought that she had never seen him so serious. Surprisingly, most of his speech centered on the welfare of the residents and their problems. And at that moment, Oris came up behind them. He said in a whisper to the girl that it was astounding. Anne didn't expect to see him, but the knight went on and said that the duke was the kindest man of the aristocratic family. No one cares for the people as much as he does. Then they looked at Gerald, who was concentrating on his speech. The duke continued speaking as his gaze suddenly turned backstage and his eyes met Anne's. The girl, startled, immediately drew the curtains and thought he had caught her peeping. It's just embarrassing. But then suddenly, her musings were interrupted by the voice of the knight, who said that the speech was coming to an end, and they could slowly head towards the recreation hall. Demaris suggested they all three of them go. The girl said sure, and ran after them. And so, ten minutes later, the speech was finally finished, and all three of them were sitting in the common room waiting for the duke. The young lord looked at the girl and said that her cheeks were very red. Oris agreed with him and replied that it had been long enough. But at that moment the curtains were pulled back, and Gerald came into the room. The knight stood up at once when he saw him. At this moment, Anne was very excited because now step number two was about to begin. She stood up to greet the duke, too. Oris. At that moment walked up to the lord and whispered something in his ear. The girl and the boy just stood there and watched the whole thing. Anne suddenly wondered if Gerald would be disappointed in them after making such a statement and distracting him from an important matter. But then suddenly the Duke spoke up and asked if Oris was lying, if his son had really demanded something so unreasonable. Demaris, a little upset, he took hold of the girl's skirt and answered his father that yes, he really wanted it that way. Then he looked him straight in the eye and replied that he had never been to a party before. So I decided to ask him to have fun together. Gerald didn't say anything to that. He just stood there for a while, staring at them. After that, he whispered something in the ear of the knight Oris. Oris said that everything would be done as he said. Anne, at this point a little even upset, thinking that he apparently intended to attend that play anyway. But he told the knight in a louder voice to give way sooner to the performance, for he could not miss it. He would take his place there, and at the next events. Anne, hearing this, was very much surprised. She turned to his grace and asked if he had changed his plans. The duke at this point walked over to his son, patted him on the head and said that that was right. We'd better walk to the stores. He then turned his gaze to the girl and asked if she would like to go with them for company. Anne saw at that moment that the success rate had already risen to 15%, but she certainly didn't refuse such an offer. And so a few minutes later, they were all ready at the Harvest Festival. In the novel, the place with the stores was described in vivid detail, but when Anne found herself there in person, she thought it was much better than she had imagined when reading the book. After walking a little further, the girl said that the street was quite lively, and it really was. There were a lot of people walking in the streets. At that moment, de Marie noticed from afar the different toys that were being sold right on the street. He asked his father if he could go and have a closer look. The Duke replied that of course he could. Then the boy immediately ran up to those toys and began to examine them joyfully. Anne, watching all this, told the Duke that she had never seen him so excited before. But then suddenly Gerald spoke in a serious tone and asked the girl if she was the one who had taught him to speak like that. The Duke was referring to what the boy said about never having attended a party before. So he decided to have fun with all three of us. Gerald said that Oris had already told him everything and asked the girl if she wanted to explain herself. 
Anne was a little startled and realized that he had already found out about everything after all. So she said that yes, she had said there was no other way to get him out. The boy understands the Duke's busyness, some kind of nothing, and doesn't ask for anything, but she's sure he's probably still a child. And so Demaris, like any other child, needs attention and care. Anne ends by saying that if he disagrees with her, let him say so. But the Duke interrupted her and replied that she had done the right thing. The girl certainly hadn't expected that. She looked at him in surprise and wondered if he had really taken her act well. But at that moment their conversation was interrupted by Demoris, who turned to Papa and Mrs. Brianna. The girl immediately ran up to the boy and asked him what was wrong. The young gentleman replied that the gentleman wanted to give him a present. Demaris pointed to a guy who was standing nearby. When Anne looked, she saw Ethan and Sophia right away. She was surprised. But at that moment the Duke came up to them and asked what they wanted. When Sophia was about to say something, Gerald interrupted her. He walked over to Ethan and said he remembered his face and asked if he owned the bookstore. The guy replied that that was correct. Then Anne noticed that the atmosphere was getting worse. She didn't understand why it seemed as if they were sworn enemies of each other. Then suddenly Gerald asked, What business does Ethan have with his son? And at that moment Sophia intervened in the conversation. The girl said that Mr. Ethan would like to please the young master with a present. After that she held out several different toys. The Duke turned to his son and asked if he liked them. Demoris thought for a moment. After that he replied that he liked them very much. Then Gerald told him to have them wrapped. Anne, who was just standing there watching it all, was shocked because the success scale kept going up and she doesn't see where the logic is in that. The Duke then said that unless he was mistaken, the toys on the table were for charity. Sophia replied that is correct. Each one is the handiwork of orphans from orphanages, and the profits from them are later donated to orphanages. Then Gerald took his son in his arms and told them to leave parts in the diet and send the rest to the ducal mansion. One honorable would pay the full cost. Anne was surprised to hear this. She couldn't believe that he had decided to buy up everything to help underprivileged children. This one smiled and said that he would bring all the toys the next morning. And Sophia thanked him and said that she was sure the little ones would be very happy about it. Gerald turned to Brianna and said that it was time for them to go. The girl agreed and followed him. After that, they traveled onward. Demoris, who was sitting in his father's arms, was playing with his new toys. And Anne went to the cotton candy counter and bought one. Then she asked the boy if he wanted one. He immediately got excited and said that of course he wanted to. And after that he looked at his hands, in which there were toys, and thought that he would not be able to eat and hold them. Gerald, who noticed his face, asked if he would like Mrs. Brianna to feed him. The boy said he wouldn't mind. Anne did not expect this, and asked what it was not such a thing to mean. Then the Duke looked at her and said that she herself had called Demoris pampered after all. But the girl had no options left, so she had to feed the young master cotton candy. At that moment, she thought that he must have done that on purpose. And so after a few hours of their walk, evening came. Strolling past the shopping streets, Anne had flashbacks of going to farmer's markets in her homeworld. But at that moment, Demoris asked for another piece of cotton candy. Then the girl, not noticing that the Duke had already lowered the boy to the floor, reached right up to Gerald's face. She immediately realized what she'd done and apologized, saying she hadn't been watching where she put the absorbent cotton. She wondered why she'd suddenly pulled it for Gerald, but at this moment, the Duke just took a bite of cotton candy, not paying attention to the girl's words. Fireworks were set off in honor of the celebration. Demoris saw them and said they were insanely beautiful, and the Duke slurped the cotton candy and thought it was very sweet. Anne was confused. She didn't understand why he had suddenly done something so confusing. However, she realized that if fireworks were now rattling in the sky, it meant that the meeting with the princess had been successfully averted. After thinking about it, Brianna turned to the master and asked if it was already time for the young master to get some sleep. It was already possible to gradually return home. But at that moment her words were interrupted by a man's shout. He was asking people to get out of the way because the coachman's horses were not obeying him. Anne didn't even manage to realize that danger was coming at them as the Duke immediately grabbed her and the baby and pushed them out of the way. When the wagon passed, he asked the girl if she was okay. Anne was shocked, but she replied that she was fine, after which she asked the boy how he was feeling. Demaris replied that he was fine. Anne was very indignant about the situation. 
but she said it was good that no one was hurt, and thought to herself, who was it that liked to race in the middle of the alley? And at that moment a girl stepped out of the wagon. Anne, of course, recognized her. It was Princess Alana Wahlberg. The girl thought that crossing paths with her on the street was no good, and the success rate had dropped six points. Some time had passed since then, and Anne was sitting in class with Demaris. The guy, seeing the look on the girl's face, asked, Maybe she has something wrong? Anne said it didn't matter. It was nothing. But the boy said she had looked anxious since this morning, and he was very worried about her. The girl looked at him. Then she smiled and apologized, saying that some thoughts just couldn't let her go, and they were unpleasant. That situation with the princess happened three days ago. The girl came up to them then and said hello to the duke. She asked to accept her apology for the inconvenience, but Gerald told her that a lady of her status shouldn't be walking around in places like this, in full view of everyone. Alana agreed and said he was correct, then added that she was going to have a lavish banquet and would like him to grace the rest of the guests with his presence. The girl said that she would send a man the next day to deliver the invitation. However, the Duke replied that there was no need for that. He had too much work, so he would not be able to attend the feast. The princess said it was too bad, because his father would have been so happy to see him. Gerald thought for a moment. After that, she said that it was understandable, but since it was his majesty's wish, he dared not refuse. The girl immediately rejoiced. And just like that, after Alana showed up, the scale had dropped to 10%. But now Anne was worried about something else entirely. Even though she'd gotten Gerald away from the fateful event, she still hadn't prevented their meeting. If she can't do anything about it at this point, then according to the original plot, the baby will definitely... But at that moment, the girl's musing was interrupted by Demaris, who came over and stroked her head to calm her down. And after that, he asked, She must be thinking about something unpleasant, but don't let her be sad. He is there to support her. Anne had not expected such a gesture of attention, but she was very pleased and mentally thanked the little angel for such a thing, and in reality, hugged the boy. Consider that she won't let anyone hurt him. In the novel, he lost control of his magic during a party thrown by the princess. So the girl decided that if he could learn to control it, the trouble would simply bypass her. And in this situation, only one person can help with this. Of course, it is the strongest mage of this world, Ethan. So after her lessons with Demaris, the girl went straight to his bookstore. Stopping right at the entrance, the girl wondered if she should just go in. The narrative describes how kind, who has bailed out a lot of ordinary peasant children, wielding magic. Demaris, however, is from the upper classes, which means he's bound to get a lot of attention. But Anne decided that it was unlikely that even a man as honest as there would expose himself to such a risk. Then suddenly the girl stopped where she was and thought that she had to pull herself together. All the effort for the sake of this beautiful boy. And there was no need to doubt or be afraid of anything at all. And so, after standing outside for a while longer, she mustered up the courage to go into this bookstore after all. But when Anne said hello, she saw that there was no one there. The girl was very surprised, because it was a rather famous bookstore. Well then a girl's voice came out and asked who it was. When she came out she saw Anne and asked if it was her again. But she apologized, saying she was alone in the shop today, so she was a little late. It was Sophia. But the girl replied that it was fine. And when she wanted to say something else, the girl immediately interrupted her and asked if it was because of the Duke's son. Anne was very surprised to hear this, and Sophia replied that she could help her problem a little. Well, seeing the girl freaked out, Sophia replied that she could take it easy. She already knew that the boy had magic when he barely made it across the threshold of the store. She explained that it was very rare for adults to lose control of their magic. So on top of the young wizard's failing health, it wasn't too hard to guess. At that moment, Anne thought that Sophia knew about witchcraft too, but the novel didn't even mention it. And after all, she wasn't the person who had detected this mana surge, but some mysterious figure. The girl sighed heavily and thought that it was time to train Demaris in spellcasting after all. So she told Sophia that was correct. The girl immediately asked what exactly she needed her help with. Anne said she was just begging her and Mr. Ethan, Twilight's guide, to mentor the boy and teach him how to control the bursts of energy. Sophia snickered a little and asked, Is it getting out that she already knows his real activities? And she thought to herself that she had asked Ethan so many times not to wear her stupid cape. But Anne, as expected by mentioning the pseudonym of the protagonist, 
got rid of unnecessary suspicion. Then she told Sophia that she wasn't quite sure if he would agree to bail them out in such a difficult situation. In fact, no one really wants to get involved with the Stewart family. Sophia said that they have always tried to take care of children with such problems. Of course, they will not leave the Duke's son in trouble. Anne was delighted with the news and said it was wonderful. She thought, however, that she hadn't told Gerald about her decision yet, and she didn't know how he would react. Sophia saw the girl's frightened face and asked, Hasn't she discussed the matter with His Highness yet? But don't let her panic. She should talk to Ethan first. After that, she smiled and said that when she had decided everything, the two of them would pay them a visit. Anne said, All right, and thought to herself that this was simply not a lady, but a real angel. After that, she went home. When she returned to the manor, she went straight to the Duke's house. When she knocked on the door, Gerald immediately said she could come out. The girl walked into his office and immediately said hello to him, and thought to herself that she had no reason to give up now. She must cope with the difficulties. The Duke looked at the girl and asked, She's the one who's been walking recently, isn't she, Anne? Was surprised, but asked how he knew that. Gerald explained that Demaris had lost her even in his office, showing up with inspections. The girl said that she was just trying to find a new teacher for the young master. She was insanely nervous about it, even started stuttering. After a little silence, the Duke asked, and for what reason she was quite good at her job. The girl said at once that she meant the sorcerer pedagogue. Anne thought it was some kind of nightmare, and she didn't understand why those words had suddenly rolled off her tongue. Gerald pulled himself away from his business, looked at the girl carefully, and asked what it was she was saying. Anne saw the most eerie look and cold voice in front of her, but still she stood her ground and asked if he remembered that incident in the bookstore. The girl said that when it happened, it was by a stroke of fate that those hosts saved them, and thanks to the proceeds, they were able to escape in time. Anne added that he probably wouldn't believe her words right now, but Sir Ethan was a wizard too, and could teach the baby to control his magic then the problems would finally be over. At last the girl said that they also agreed, but the Duke wasn't listening to her anymore. He jumped up from his chair and asked how she knew about his abilities. He then looked her straight in the eye and asked her who else she had time to tell about it. Anne even started to shake with fear, but she said she never told anyone else. Gerard sighed heavily and said, what if there's gossip among the community now? But the girl interrupted him and said that there would be no such thing. The man didn't listen. He said her job was to watch over the son of imperial blood, to protect the outsiders. After these words, he had already raised his voice and said that because of her foolish will, she had now put the heir to the Stuarts in great danger. Anne didn't answer him anything. She just stood and watched, and thought to herself that the protagonists of the world, after all, there is no point in harming those around them. They are the kindest in the novel. But the Duke said that enough discussion was over. He would take care of the rest. Anne asked that he let her explain herself. But the Duke said that she had indeed disappointed him, and from now on Demaris no longer needed a governess, just like in The Wizard Mentor. When Anne wanted to say something to him, the man interrupted and told her to just go away. 